Hello, everyone. Is that working? That sounds good. All right. So um, what I want to talk about today is a little bit of how Julia works, give a sort of deep dive into some of the internals, um, especially looking at how the compiler works, how it optimizes code, and a little bit about this question of, is Julia ahead of time statically compiled language? Is it a JIT compiled language? Um, what's going on there? So a little uh, overview of the agenda for the talk here. Um, I want to start with talking about a little bit why does Julia use inference? Uh, what is type inference as used by Julia? Uh, talk a little bit about memoization. What does that mean? Um, how this allows us to do incremental sim simplification to the code that lets it run faster. Um, and then get into some of the fix for the infamous method 265 where you type in a method, you'd start trying to make changes, and then your changes wouldn't be reflected. So how do we get that to work? Uh, and as there's, if there's some time at the end, I'll try to do um, a little more information on data flow inference and how we use that. So the key idea we have is we want to do things once. The, f the fastest way to do something is not to do it at all. Second fastest way is to do it once. So. <laughs> um, as the XKCD Black Hat Man says, with a little bit of caching, there's uh, just about anything you can do. Before we get into what the compiler does, I thought I'd give a little example of how, um, just in user code, we can even start to see some of this principle applied. So the memoize function is a function that, given a set of arguments, when called, will evaluate the function once, and then every time you call it after that, we'll remember the result that it got. Um, so we can jump into the Julia REPL here uh, and go back up to there we go, memoize function. Um, and then we could define, say, memoize of the plus function. And oops, wrong one. Works just like the plus function. We get the same answer every time. Um, but perhaps that's not quite interesting because you can't tell the difference, which is sort of the point. Um, so then we might instead define um, something with side effect, like printing. And then when we print something, we see uh, every time it prints, it gives a different result. But then if we try to print it again, we see that it is not returning the result um, so this is one way we can do uh, making sure that the compiler is only running something once. And if that was a much more expensive function, it could be saving quite a bit of time. Um, we can go and do this other ways. So not only was that function storing the result of the um, addition or the printing that we did, we could also think about the method itself as a memoization of the code. So I didn't have to retype that into the REPL every time I wanted to try it with a new value. Um, we can do metaprogramming. We can kind of do the same thing on the definition of a method. So just taking a different approach. Uh, the general idea of metaprogramming is basically you take code, you treat it as data, and then you can run an expression on it. So in this case, I do the same thing. I create a new dictionary when you call the method pull apart the method definition that you give it a little bit, um, pull out the argument list, and then uh, with this macro, we can get exactly the same result as before. Uh, so there we go back over here. So then I pull in that macro. Um, and I'm using macro tools. Uh, what's oh, split function? All right, so then I can redefine a similar method, add two, has the same uh, behavior as the other one. We could redefine print once, two, and again, we see the same thing. It's recomputing once um, and memoizing the result. So going back my slides here. How do we use that? Well, in the compiler, we have many, many more stages of this. 
that every time you do an operation, it has some way that it records that, and we often then have hooks back into um, the user so they can override that step and put in a different result. So we start at the top, you define a method, we record that. Um, method, metaprogramming macros can help you make that, do that simpler. If you've ever looked at the reflection tools, um, it can be very useful for seeing how everything steps through <coughs> the compiler, and you can see each transformation level. If you try to start at the method definition, go right to code native, sometimes it's not very clear what transforms the compiler made. Um, so the first step here is code lowered. That just simplifies the code structure. Um, very small transform, but it lets us have very expressive code that we write turn into something that's very simple so the compiler doesn't have to um, think about all of these different constructs and how they can interact. Um, and then we have generated functions which let you plug in at that level. So instead of defining a method definition and having it um, automatically lowered for every set of arguments that you pass it, you can have a generated function. So it generates a different code lowered every time you call it for a different set of argument types. Um, the next step that usually happens is we type in for that code. Type inference lets us see um, how that code, what types it has, what operations it needs to do, what operations it doesn't need to do. And when we create a precompiled module, so if you do, um, when you're making a module, if you have double underscore precompile at the top, we create these precompiled modules, and that's the code that we're saving. So everything through that step is stored in there so that we can quickly rerun, or we don't have to rerun the code steps before that. Um, and that consists of some global inference. So we look at all of the functions that you have, figure out what types the um, method that you're calling would do, what operations it does, and then we apply a bunch of local optimization. So knowing that you're calling a plus function, we know that it, if you call it with integers, it returns an integer, so we can keep propagating all of that information and simplify the code that way. Um, and there's also code warn type very closely related but just adds highlighting so anytime there's dynamic behavior that you don't expect, you can use that to find it faster in some cases, many cases. Um, from there, we go and convert the code into LLVM. LLVM's this great compiler used uh, initially as the back end for Clang. They split it out into a library so other people could write front ends for it. And they have many, many optimization passes that have been written by great compiler people over the years. And by taking our code representation and converting it into a representation in an LLVM, we can take advantage of all of their work. Um, and we can also plug into it. So outputting LLVM code means that we can then plug in external code gen so that you can take the result from that code LLVM and say, then feed it to a GPU. So I know the next talk is on how people have been doing that. Um, and then you can go the other direction too. If you have some C++ code, that is generating LLVM IR. You can take that and connect it directly into Julia, jit the whole result, and get uh, a really fast interop between those two languages with a lot of flexibility. Uh, and then the final step uh, that Julia manages is code native, and that's when you reach the level of machine code representation, so then we can hand that directly off to the machine. And when we generate a static system image, such as um, is usually used when we build Julia. We store a bunch of that machine code so that it doesn't have to recompute. Uh, the transform from code LLVM to code native, which is generally quite expensive, so that's why um, caching is quite important because each of these steps can take quite a while. Uh, but the result generally is the same uh, every time we run it. That's one of the primary goals is that we make sure the result is the same every time we run it. Um, so that we don't need to rerun it uh, unless we know that it's going to change. And so I said this is the internal levels. You could actually go further. Even once you reach the machine code and you start handing that off to the processor, the processor internally has several more steps very similar to this, where it has code caches that it reads in the instructions that you've given it and reorders them and pulls them apart and recombines them and figures out fast, efficient ways of doing it. And on a modern machine, that can be an order of magnitude difference of performance in, uh, in common cases. 
um, because it's caching more results even than we are. Uh, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to try to focus on this code types concept and um, what Julia does with it, what optimizations we do, and how to understand that. The big word I would say for that is interprocedural optimization. This is kind of the big word phrase that people use for how compilers work. Um, and it's really where we get most of the power from. This is saying, if we just had one function in isolation, there's some optimizations we can apply. But without knowing what any other function in the system is doing, you're really limited on how much information you can get out. So even like integer plus, without knowing that integer plus is going to call the processor intrinsic for addition, we can't say anything about it. We just know that it's a function. And then we'd have to do everything dynamically. So interprocedural optimization is a big word that just basically means looking at what all of the functions do rather than one function at a time. And how do we do that? Well, we have a data flow inference algorithm written in Julia that does ahead of time optimization. Uh, and I say this is ahead of time optimization. It happens generally just as you start calling methods. But unlike a typical JIT that you see in many languages like JavaScript, it doesn't run the code several times, see what types happen to be there, and then try to figure out what to compile to optimize for what it's seeing, and then has to check if any of that changes. It might have to regenerate it. Julia says, we know what types the user's given us, and we're going to optimize for those types, and we're going to make sure it's expressive enough that whatever result you get from that is really going to be the result you wanted. And the compiler could do some profile-guided optimization and get some better results doing the usual JIT tricks, um, but just that there's not as much performance benefit to that. So it's not, it's quite possible in the future, Julia will add a JIT of that common well-known form because we have the ability to. Um, we have a compiler running at, uh, and available at runtime generally, but it's just significantly less necessary uh, than algorithms, that, uh, than languages that depend on it. Um, and I've written about this and have a blog post online. And if I have some time at the end, I'll try to um, look at that more. Otherwise, um, feel free to look at that on later. Um, but delving in a little bit, just to some of the structure of this. What happens in inference for the interprocedural optimization case is that if you just have a simple function call f calls g, that means we start at f. We know that we're going to call f. We want to find out what it does. We say, well, that means there's a edge or a call that starts at f and results in a call to g occurring. And it's fairly simple, but it's just a nice graph representation that says this is where this is the structure of the program um, that is hypothesized by the compiler. Uh, I say hypothesized because one issue with inference is you don't know for certain that there'll be a call there. Um, with you know that it could call there. You've considered that. Given the information you know, it might reach that point in the code. But we can't know for certain that it just didn't hit a return statement before then or hit an infinite loop. Um, one of the ancient problems of computer programming is just that you can't compute whether something will even complete. So we can't know for certain whether something will get called. Um, I've had. Some questions. Recently, we've added a bunch of things called back edges to the compiler. So what's a back edge? Um, basically, it's shortening backwards edge. But what is it? It's a little harder. Um, a forward edge is a call. We see syntactically in the code that there's something getting called. Um, but the arrow only goes in one direction. So we know that an edge lets us figure out what the valid return type is. So every time. So as we're scanning the function, figuring out what it does, we see an edge. We see a function call that does something else. We figure out what that does. And then we know what the return value is from that and continue using that in the inference. A back edge isn't quite as precise as that. It 
does give us some information um, and it helps us compute whether that optimized code is valid. So this back edge concept was very important for figuring out when the optimizations that you've applied might not be valid anymore. You might have to start over, figure out what you need to redo to get an updated method, um, which Julia says happens whenever you add a new method, we might have changed the inference result. Uh, so a famous saying by uh, some famous guy was that it's only two hard things in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. Uh, it took us, uh, I think, six years since the release of the language to invalidate most caches. So there seems to be some truth in this. Uh, and in fact, yeah, there's quite a few different back edges that we have to track. Um, and all of these are somewhat interrelated, but also have a lot of just slight differences between all of them. So the first one, the top, is a fairly simple. If you just have a method that calls the second method, then you know there's, that's the caller of the method at that time. If you have some crazy complicated cycle, like I represented with the um, squares and arrows up there, then back edges become a little bit stranger to compute because you have to figure out all of the different ways that you could traverse arrows to reach functions and discover that you know, they're all interdependent in that case. Uh, then we can have more, so those are both inference back edges. We can have uh, optimization back edges when we inline code from the method or devirtualize the dispatch um, and inline the direct call to something. Those back edges need to be treated slightly differently because we've extracted different and more information out of those. Uh, and then a few of the other back edges we end up having here is method cache. So every time you call something, we see what you called and try to put it in a really fast cache so that the next time you call it, it will be much, much faster. And so we need to make sure those don't stick around if you change and add a method. Um, just method lookup in general can change. And then we have one more the case that's kind of strange is if a method lookup didn't exist at all, but we were depending on that method not existing during inference, we need to make sure that also gets invalidated. Um, and it knows that the lack of method call will change and become a method. Uh, but all of that lets us do fun results like this where we can redefine core built-in functions and see that they work. So here, I'm trying to show that uh, I can count the number of additions that happened in the program. We're redefining base addition here um, and doing it very carefully so that we make sure our new definition is valid. If you say replaced point of intrinsics dot add int with sub int, it will blow up pretty quickly um, when you try to tell it that in addition is subtraction. Uh, so just running through this quickly, the first line we just create a place to hold the number of additions that we have. We create a function here with a couple additions in it. We look at our addition counter before and after doing those and return the difference in that counter. When we first call it, we haven't used the add counter for anything, so it's zero as we expect and fully compiled. Um, and then we redefine plus to increment the adds and then uh, do the actual addition. And now when we call, or when we look at the value of that ads, we can see that it's going up pretty quickly. Just type input into the REPL, use a bit of integer addition. And if we call our count ads, we can see it gives us four because it's recompiled everything. So notice that count ads had an edge to plus. So when we redefine plus, we followed that back edge back and got uh, recompiled count adds to make sure it reflected the change in definition. And we have four plus signs at the top, so we've counted four additions of code in the code exactly as we wanted. Uh, <laughs> how does that happen? Yeah, and then there's a much longer slot on how does that happen. Um, so when we added that new plus method, that increments what I call the world counter that keeps track of essentially how many methods we've added. And when we do that, we need to figure out all of the methods that that changed. In this case, it was just one, just the initial add int um, method. So we collected that whole list of one method. 
Uh, remove that from the fashion dispatch cat, cache. So if I just call plus, I don't want to make, see the old one anymore. Yeah, we want to make sure we get the new one. We want to make sure inference doesn't see that. And then we have to repeat that for all the back edges. Uh, and so there's where our back edges come in for one case. Um, we have all the same steps, except the difference um, on the second case is that we have to also track which signatures would have been a method error, but then we added a new method that now covers that method error, and that could also change the inference result. So if we thought it was going to be, if, if we thought we were trying to call a method that didn't exist at all, and then you added it, it would need to realize that that went from calling method error um, to actually returning an answer and using that uh, new information. The other complication with uh, back edges is that we want to be incremental. And so, I guess it was about two years ago, we added the ability to have .ji files that sort incremental information uh, with the double underscore precompile. Double underscore precompile. And we couldn't just like turn that off all of a sudden and be like, yeah, that seems too hard. So that is tricky since we can't store back edges. The back edges are from things that you call the precompiled things only have the callee, the caller in them. So it ends up we needed to fl invert the back edges graph, turn them back into edges, flatten that, and then invert it again to restore them. And that seems to be working pretty well. We've, the last change to that was only a few weeks ago. Uh, so there's probably still bugs in it. But we're hoping it's getting closer. Uh, and validating the edges looks very similar to the case where we just added a new method. We need to make sure that none of the methods that were added in whatever the user did in the current runtime process were not were were also methods that had been added in the precompile process. Um, and so the way we do that, as I have at the bottom here, so. There's this function called lower bounds dependent world set. And the, um, what this function does is say, given the set of modules that used to be available in my precompiled process, is the method I'm looking at in that set, or was it only in the current runtime process because of whatever the user's been doing in the current process? And then we need to figure out if it's Depending on which one it is, we need to figure out if we need to look at an older method to find which one it had been seeing in the precompile process, or if it's a newer method. Um, and then that will tell us whether or not the serializ serialized work that we have is valid. And if it's valid, yay, the cache is good, and we can reuse it and keep it running. If it's not good, aw, now we have to recompile and it's slower. Um, and so sometimes when you load big packages that redefine lots of methods, there's a little delay the next time you type with the REPL because it's decided that a bunch of those methods are no longer valid. And it needs to figure out what the new method looks like given whatever changes made by that um, module. Recomputing validity is still kind of an open question. We wanted to make sure all the back edges were in so that invalidation all worked. But sometimes that's a little bit overkill. We invalidate everything even though the result might not have changed. Often you add a new method, but it does exactly the same thing as the old method used to do. Um, figuring out whether it does exactly the same thing is a little tricky. So that's where uh, the to-do implement guy has got a little bit of a sweat drop there, uh, hoping to make that work eventually. Um, but currently, there's a few limitations with it. It seems to work pretty well, um, so we're pretty happy with that. Um, but there's, I think, a lot of room to make it faster, to make it a little more accurate, um, to make it use a little bit me less memory in that. Right now, we don't really have a good way to garbage collect old values. So when you see inference changes, um, something gets deleted and methods no longer used. We don't really know that it's never going to be used. We just think that maybe it's never going to be used. And so we have to keep it around because we don't, we don't have a way to check that right now. Um, and with that, I 
can take questions.